Welcome to NTD News. I'm Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. The Secretary of State makes a surprise visit to Afghanistan a day after Biden announced all troops are heading home. Some officials say the drawdown is the right move, but what are some Republican lawmakers saying about the decision? Top U.S. spy agencies warn about the China threat. They say Beijing is trying to change global norms in favor of its authoritarian system. Democrats are down to a razor-thin majority in the House after Republican Julia Letlow is sworn in. How will that impact President Joe Biden's agenda? A surge of unaccompanied minors is flowing into the U.S. across the southern border, and the Biden administration is scrambling to house them. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem is telling the White House not to send them to her state. We take you to the Health and Freedom Conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The event features top names in the field of politics, health, and business. Just in, President Biden imposing fresh sanctions on Russia. The White House says the new executive order is meant to impose costs on Russia for acting against U.S. sovereignty, including efforts to undermine free and fair elections in the U.S., malicious cyber activities, and transitional corruption. The order also expels some Russian diplomatic personnel. Russia condemned the fresh round of sanctions and promised to respond. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Afghanistan today. He spoke with the president of the country and said the partnership between the two nations is changing, but it is also enduring. And we hear from lawmakers and officials on their reaction to the troop withdrawal. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Afghanistan on Thursday in a surprise visit one day after Biden announced the final troop withdrawal. He met with the Afghan president and expressed the commitment of the U.S. to the country and its people. He addressed U.S. troops stationed there. I am uh, constantly in awe of uh, what you've achieved, uh, what you're doing, um, and I know this is a, uh, a moment for many of uh, uh, mixed emotions. These are uh, hard, uh, hard choices, hard decisions. Speaking from Belgium on Wednesday, Blinken said the U.S. will coordinate closely with its allies and withdraw troops from Afghanistan responsibly. Let me be clear, even with our troops home, we as an alliance and the United States as a country will continue to invest in and support the Afghan people and their chosen leaders. Blinken says the U.S. will hold the Taliban accountable to its commitment to keep al-Qaeda from launching attacks against the U.S. from Afghanistan. Biden said on Thursday the troops will all be home by September 11th. And we don't believe that Maintaining an indefinite troop presence in Afghanistan is in our interests, not for the United States, not for NATO and our allies. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell disapproves of the move. He claims the Biden administration has abandoned U.S. efforts in Afghanistan that have kept terrorism in check. And bizarrely, they've decided to do so by September the 11th. Apparently, we're to help our adversaries ring in the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks by gift wrapping the country and handing it right back to them. Senator Lindsey Graham also says bringing the troops home is a bad idea. He says a residual force is needed to keep al-Qaeda from re-emerging. With all due respect to President Biden, you have not ended the war, you have extended it. You have made it bigger, not smaller. You're going to do to us what you did in Iraq, put us in a world of hurt. A U.S. Navy veteran has mixed feelings about the withdrawal. I just naturally, like a lot of folks, had envisioned um, uh, some greater level of success before we, we withdrew. There's a, a common term that we use because uh, uh, the term is forgotistan, um, because the American public has largely forgotten that we've been over there. So it's hard to keep engaged in a war when the American public don't even realize what our mission is. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Biden is right to withdraw troops, but he says the administration's tactics, timing and execution will be key. NATO is also set to withdraw their military forces from the country while the U.S. does. The leader of NATO says Afghanistan needs to build a safe country for its citizens going forward. And the U.K. says it will support an orderly departure of its forces as NATO withdraws its troops and help Afghanistan build up its capacity to govern itself. 
U.S. spy agencies are warning about the Chinese regime's threat to national security. They say Beijing will continue to try to spread its own influence and undercut the United States. The top U.S. spy official said Wednesday the Chinese regime is an unparalleled priority for the U.S. intelligence community. China increasingly is a near-peer competitor, challenging the United States in multiple areas while pushing to revise global norms in ways that favor the authoritarian Chinese system. The U.S. intelligence community released their annual threat assessment Tuesday. It cast China's push for global power as the leading threat to U.S. national security. China is employing a comprehensive approach to demonstrate its growing strength. It also has substantial cyber capabilities that, if deployed at a minimum, can cause localized temporary disruptions to critical infrastructure inside the United States. The FBI director says the agency has over 2,000 investigations that tie back to the Chinese regime. And on the economic espionage investigation side alone, it's about a 1,300 percent increase over the last several years. We're opening a new investigation in China every 10 hours. He said Beijing uses various tactics to influence American elites at all levels. The uh, tools in their toolbox uh, to um, influence our businesses, our academic institutions, our governments at all levels um, are deep and wide uh, and persistent. They also discussed the origins of the CCP virus. The spy agency said they're still unsure how the virus first spread to humans. Basically, components have coalesced around two alternative theories. Um, these scenarios are it emerged naturally from human contact with infected animals, or it was a laboratory accident. The CIA director said Beijing has been withholding information. The one thing that's clear to us and to our analysts is that the Chinese leadership has not been fully forthcoming or fully transparent in working with the WHO or, you know, in providing the kind of original complete data that would help answer those questions. He said the CIA is using its resources to try to get to the bottom of the virus's origin story. As growing numbers of unaccompanied minors sweep across the U.S. southern border, the Biden administration is reaching out to states to house them. But South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem and some other Republican governors are saying no. Noem wrote on Twitter, South Dakota won't be taking any illegal immigrants that the Biden administration wants to relocate. She made the statement as the Biden administration scrambles to house the surge of unaccompanied minors coming across the border. The number of them crossing the border more than doubled from February to March. There are almost 20,000 per month now. Media reports say the administration is reaching out to numerous states for help in housing the minors. The Washington Post reports that the administration is considering flying migrant families and children to states near the Canadian border. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is now involved. Uh, we want to be able to help out HHS with setting up shelter capacity uh, for the children. Nome joins her fellow Republican governors of South Carolina, Nebraska, and Iowa. They've all declined requests to take in illegal immigrants. South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster signed an executive order to prioritize children from his state. It prevents the migrant children from placement in the state's residential and foster care system. Republicans blame President Joe Biden for causing the crisis. Biden says the influx is a normal seasonal pattern. He says it happens every winter. Though other administration officials have contradicted the president, Cindy Huang directs HHS's Office of Refugee Resettlement. She says the problem is going to get more severe. Vice President Kamala Harris revealed she will soon visit two Latin American countries to address the root cause of migration to the U.S. Wednesday marked Harris's first meeting on the issue since taking on the role in March. Vice President Kamala Harris will be traveling to Mexico and Guatemala in the wake of the border crisis. She made the announcement during a virtual roundtable discussion on the root cause of immigration Wednesday morning. Well, I have talked with uh, the president of Mexico, the, Me the president of Guatemala. Um, we have, uh, well, I'm probably saying too much, but we have plans in the work to go to Guatemala um, as soon as possible, um, given all of the restrictions in terms of COVID and things of that nature. Harris said she will first visit Mexico before heading to the northern triangle country Guatemala. She didn't provide a timeline, but said she will be going sometime soon. 
A reporter asked Harris if she planned on visiting the border. She responded, saying that President Biden appointed Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to deal with the border, while she was appointed to handle the root cause of the migration, indicating she will not be visiting the border. Harris hosted the virtual roundtable with experts on the Northern Triangle countries, El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras. The vice president said most people don't want to leave their home countries, so they are working on solving the issues causing them to flee to the U.S. Um, we are looking at issues that have been a long time in the making. Uh, we are looking at issues that relate to the need for economic development, a need for resilience around extreme climate. She added they are also seeking to address good governance and corruption, as well as providing the countries with agricultural resources. Harris said they are looking to internationalize their effort in the region. This includes reaching out to allies through the United Nations. And amidst diplomatic relations, there seems to have been a miscommunication between the U.S. and Guatemala. On Tuesday, Guatemala's government challenged the Biden administration's assertion that Guatemala agreed to send more troops to its own borders, a move aimed at reducing the flow of migrants into the U.S. The White House said Monday the U.S. had reached an agreement with Mexico, Honduras and Guatemala and that all three countries would increase their border security. Guatemala uh, surged 1,500 police and military personnel to its southern border with Honduras and agreed to set up 12 checkpoints along the migratory route. However, Guatemala's government said in a Spanish-language statement there is no document signed regarding border security. The country's officials said the 1,500 law enforcement and military personnel were already deployed to the border in January. Democrats are down to a six-member majority in the House now that Republican Representative Julia Letlow is sworn into office. But Democrats can still block legislation with just a few votes. Representative Julia Letlow replaces her late husband Luke Letlow in the U.S. House. He died of the CCP virus before he could take office. She says they were a team. She was sworn in Wednesday. It's an honor and a privilege to stand here today as the first Republican woman elected to Congress from Louisiana. Three House Democrats also joined the Biden administration. Now Democrats hold a slim 218 to 212 majority with five vacant seats. If more than two Democrats join Republicans in a vote, they can block legislation. This leaves Nancy Pelosi little room for error as the House seeks to pass President Joe Biden's agenda. That agenda is expected to include infrastructure spending, gun control, and policing bills. Centrist Democrats now wield enormous power over legislation, the same way Joe Manchin does in the Senate. Democrat leaders say they're not worried. Pelosi says the shrinking majority won't be a problem, and House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer says the Democrats are doing okay. Four of the five empty seats will be filled in special elections over the next month and a half. Three of the seats belong to Democrats, and they're expected to hold on to them. The other seat is expected to stay Republican. The election for the final House seat is in November. A group of House Democrats is expected to announce a new bill. It seeks to add four more seats to the U.S. Supreme Court, expanding it from nine to 13 justices. The bill is slated to be called the Judiciary Act of 2021. House Democrat Mondaire Jones wrote on Twitter that he's introducing the bill in order to restore democracy and power to the people. Discussions by liberal activists to expand the court became more intense after former President Donald Trump nominated Amy Coney Barrett to the top court. They worried that Barrett's addition could tilt the court towards more conservative rulings. Republican lawmakers have opposed efforts to expand the Supreme Court and have made proposals to prevent Democrats from changing the number of seats. Washington, D.C. is now one step closer to becoming the 51st state of the United States. Today, the House Oversight and Reform Committee voted in favor of H.R. 51, also known as the Washington, D.C. Admissions Act. The bill would grant statehood to Washington, D.C. Today is an historic day for our country and our democracy. For only the second time in a generation, we will vote on whether hundreds of thousands of American citizens will finally have their voices counted in Congress. 
Under the bill, the new U.S. capital city would only include federal buildings near the National Mall, like the White House, the Capitol, the Supreme Court, and other monuments, while the rest of the city would become a new state. The bill was introduced in 2019 by D.C. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton. During the last session of Congress, the bill passed in the House, but stalled in the Senate. Norton reintroduced the bill on the first day of the new Congress. During today's hearing, Norton noted that D.C. residents pay taxes without voting representation in Congress. D.C.'s population is larger than two states, and the state of Washington, D.C. would be one of seven states with a population of one million. D.C. pays more federal taxes per capita than any state and, ha and pays more federal taxes than 21 states. Republicans, however, expressed objection to the bill. This legislation is not about voting representation of residents of D.C. I think we've got to be honest. This is about a much broader permanent change. Heiss said the bill will permanently change the playing field of American politics and allow Democrats to enact their radical progressive agenda. During the hearing, Congressman James Comer presented a letter to the committee. He said the attorney generals of 22 states wrote to congressional leaders on Tuesday, and they would challenge this bill in court. While the bill is expected to easily pass the House later this month, it will likely stall again in the Senate, just like it did last year. The annual White House Correspondents Association dinner event is on hold this year. Officials say the decision comes due to pandemic concerns and the inability to hold a large gathering indoors. The event is usually scheduled for April and typically features a high-profile comedian and good-natured teasing towards the sitting U.S. president. Previous performers who took part in the gala include Larry Wilmore, Cicely Strong, and Joe McHale. A statement from the organizers says they hope to host the dinner again in 2022, set to be the first one during the Biden administration. Texan candidates are campaigning for a spot in Congress in an upcoming special election. And this time, the pool is quite large. NTD's Jason Perry brings us an insight into some of the hopefuls on the campaign trail. 23 Texas candidates are in the race for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives as of Wednesday including 11 Republicans and 10 Democrats. Former Health and Human Services Chief of Staff Brian Harrison says why he believes he's the best candidate. Only one running who has taken on the bureaucracy and beat him, taken on the national media and beat him, taking on uh, the establishments in both parties and beat him and has made government smaller and more accountable to the American people. Another Republican candidate, Siri Kim, is a former assistant administrator for the Small Business Administration. She was recently attacked in the media as being racist towards Chinese people. Siri says her remarks were clearly about the Chinese Communist Party, but they took her words out of context. It's incredibly scandalous that the liberal media could say that I would ever be anti-Asian or anti-immigrant. I wholeheartedly welcome anyone fleeing the communist regime. A notable Democratic candidate is Jana Lynn Sanchez, who ran against Ron Wright for this particular seat in 2018. Her website, janasanchez.com, says she has a passion to advocate for better health care, better equity, and a stronger democracy. We reached out to her for comment, but didn't hear back right away. Texas's special election will fill a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives after Representative Ron Wright died of COVID-19 in February. Early voting will be held April 19th through April 27th, and Election Day will be on May 1st. Jason Perry, NTD News. An event in Tulsa, Oklahoma this week will be host to a range of well-known voices. Guest speakers include top names in politics, health, and business. NTD's Steve Lance brings us more from Oklahoma. We're here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where there'll be a Health and Freedom Expo this Friday and Saturday. The event will host some of the most prominent voices in politics, health, and business. We had a chance to stop by the event organizers, Thrive Time Podcast Studios, to find out more about the event. Well, the Health and Freedom uh, Conference has been organized to do three things. Uh, one, we want to kill the spirit of fear. All right, we have Mike Lindell. You've got Sidney Powell, General Flynn, uh, Lynn Wood, Simone Gold. Uh, you've, I mean, it's, the list is, is mind-boggling. Clark promises a packed lineup of other high-impact speakers, including many from the medical field. Uh, Dr. Bartlett, Richard Bartlett. This guy's the former top medical advisor for the governor of Texas for seven consecutive years, and he's treated thousands of COVID patients with zero deaths, which is a very low number if you, if you round it up. So I, I'm excited for people to know the truth. 
The event sold out soon after tickets went on sale a few weeks ago, but Clark said there may still be a way to attend the conference. We don't have any tickets left, but what happens is about once every hour, I get a notification that somebody canceled, and then we try to fill that spot. We'll be here covering the event live Friday and Saturday. If you want to tune in, we'll be streaming live from our website, ntd.com. Reporting from Tulsa, Steve Lance, NTD News. About two dozen people were arrested in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. This as unrest continued for the fourth night after the police shooting of a 20-year-old man. Sixty people were arrested the previous night in a riot. Demonstrators gathered around the Brooklyn Center Police Department and erected makeshift barricades. They threw bricks, bottles, and other projectiles at law enforcement officers. Eventually, the mix of state and local officers ordered the crowd to disperse. National Guard members also stepped in. The chief of the Minnesota State Patrol told reporters that there were fewer protesters than the night before, and he said though emotions were still running high, the tension was lower. The arrests were among those who remained and were largely curfew for violations, of, for violations for riot. Most of the people who were arrested did not live in the area. Authorities released the dash cam video of a police ambush in Georgia. Law enforcement officials say Monday's incident occurred after a police chase in Carlton. Three officers were injured in the shooting. A warning, the following clip contains footage some viewers might find unsettling. The Carroll County Sheriff's Office says the video was made public to show the severity of the situation. Authorities explained the officers were in pursuit of two suspects who were firing weapons at them while inside a vehicle. The footage shows the scene when deputies arrived after the suspects crashed their car. The suspects were still shooting and struck another officer. One of the suspects, Pierre Shelton, died after he was hit by return fire. The other is Shelton's cousin, Aaron Shelton. He's in police custody, facing five counts of aggravated assault and three counts of aggravated battery. And just ahead, the Lincoln Center in New York City plans to transform its main plaza into a big public park. They say outdoor summer performances will reflect the city's rich culture and history. And an annual Memorial Day motorcycle ride continues in the nation's capital after a two-year pause. But the evening is still facing challenges because of the pandemic. Find out more here on NTD News. A woman facing charges after being arrested in New York airport. That's for allegedly trying to smuggle thousands of dollars worth of cocaine in her bra. The woman arrived at JFK airport from the Dominican Republic on April 9th. Customs and Border Protection officers discovered three pellets of cocaine in her purse during the inspection. After further examination, they found more in her undergarments. She admitted to officers that she also inserted some pellets internally. In total, they seized about three pounds of cocaine, an estimated street value of more than $94,000. She now faces drug smuggling charges. Ridership in New York City's transit system is not back to pre-pandemic levels. A large number of people say they don't want to ride because it's less safe. But the city's mayor insists there's no danger. NTD's Don Tran has the details. New Yorkers are getting back on subways and buses. But there's still a portion of people not yet willing to go. An MTA survey found 57% of non-riders said they won't go because of the virus. Meanwhile, 36% said they had not been riding transit due to fears about crime. Mayor Bill de Blasio criticized the MTA for discouraging ridership by releasing the survey. And then he went underground himself to ride the subway trains. De Blasio said the subway system is safe, citing the recent addition of over 600 cops to its patrols. You can see the NYPD out there doing extraordinary work to get guns off the streets. You can see the impact of the efforts to bring community closely together with the police. You can subway felonies fell in January and February compared to the end of last year. But the dips remain less stark than drops in ridership, according to NYPD stats. De Blasio also talked about other ways the city's reducing crime. Cure violence movement, crisis management system. We keep adding more and more. It's working. We need to deepen the investments. We've said a lot of that in the last few months about the way we're going to do that. More to come. Deepen uh, the work at the community level to stop violence before it happens. Transit advocates have been pushing for more frequent trains and buses. They argue that more trains will attract ridership, which will in turn bolster safety. Don Tran, NTD News, New York. 
And starting Monday, New York City's curfews are changing. The curfew for bars and restaurants will move back one hour from 11 p.m. to midnight. The curfew for catered events will move from midnight to 1 a.m. New York City will focus on outdoor activities this summer to bring life back to the city. Lincoln Center just announced a new 14,000 square foot public park. NTD's Arian Pastar has the story. When you think about the Lincoln Center here in Manhattan, you probably think about this view right here. Three theaters surrounding the main plaza and its fountain. Now this entire plaza will be transformed into a park-like green space for the summer. And like right now, it will still be open to the public, meaning you can still come here to just relax and enjoy the sun. And on top of that, outdoor performances will be held out here as well. The transformation is part of the center's outdoor performance program happening all summer. The lineup is called Restart Stages. Lincoln Center held outdoor performances in the past. But back then, the plaza wasn't transformed into a park. The green space will be made up of synthetic grass. On it, books will be available for borrowing, a small snack bar is planned, and of course the pop-up performances. The shows will include music, dance, and a series of family presentations and workshops. One New Yorker is especially looking forward to it. Yes, I'd like to visit the park. All parks are good, so we encourage parks. Restart Stages launched its first performance last week on World Health Day. The new park is scheduled to open on May 10th and stay open until October. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. Tens of thousands of people are expected to renew the annual Memorial Day motorcycle ride in Washington, D.C. next month to raise awareness of veteran issues. This ride, known as the Rolling Thunder, has been going for over 30 years, but it was stopped for the last two years and is now under a new name, Rolling to Remember. Rolling to Remember, the Memorial Day motorcycle ride is set to return to D.C. next month after being stopped for the last two years. During the ride, military veteran advocates come together, calling on government to continue searching for soldiers missing in action. We want them to understand that many Americans care about this issue and that we demand action. The organizer says this is the world's largest one-day motorcycle event. He expects more than 20,000 people joining in this year. Nationwide riders are encouraged to participate free of charge. People who do not have motorcycles are also welcome to show their support. Many of those who come out are Gold Star families, meaning they've lost somebody uh, in combat. Uh, many of them are family members of prisoners of war and of those 80,000 who are still missing in action. This year's ride faces new challenges with the pandemic going on. The Pentagon has not approved the request to access their parking lot, which was previously used as a staging area. The rally in front of the Lincoln Memorial is canceled over social distancing concerns. But the event is already approved by the National Park Service officials, Department of Transportation officials, and local law enforcement agencies. Lin Lin, NTD News, Washington, D.C. Coming up, a California teacher has been placed on leave after she berated students during an online class. The teacher was voicing her upset over a push for in-person learning. And visitors and tourists enjoy vibrant colors at the Washington State Tulip Festival. The Skagit Valley is the U.S.'s largest producer of commercial tulips. Stay tuned to find out more. When the game's over and it's time to go home, sometimes your car has other plans. That's why I drive with Car Shield. As expensive as car repairs can be, I wanted the best defense around. And with Car Shield's administrators, they make sure that you don't get stuck with expensive car repairs like this. Did I forget to mention that with Car Shield's network, I also get 24 7 roadside assistance, towing, and rental car reimbursement included. That's peace of mind every driver needs. I saved close to $9,000. If it wasn't for car shields, I wouldn't have my car. I got to tell you, it's quite a relief not to worry about expensive car breakdowns anymore. And with Car Shields administrators, you can choose your favorite mechanic or dealer to do the work. Plus, it's easier than ever to get America's favorite car protection. There's no long-term contracts, and coverage is affordable for every wallet size. If I didn't have Car Shield, I would have been out of pocket $7,000. As a parent of three, I couldn't have that. 
I trust CarShield administrators because they paid my claim. Talk about MVP protection for less than the cost of a ball game. Take it from me, the boomer. Nobody wants to go through the headache of an expensive car breakdown on their own. If you're driving without a warranty, you have to call CarShield. Yeah, you do. So do yourself and your car a favor. Call CarShield. They're your best line of defense against expensive breakdowns. CarShield administrators paid almost $4,000 for my repairs. CarShield is wonderful. They saved me $1,300. With CarShield, I saved $4,100 on my first repair. Over a million happy drivers couldn't be wrong. Call CarShield now. Protect yourself now against expensive auto repair bills. Call CarShield for a free and instant protection plan quote. Once your car breaks down, it's too late. Call 800-781-2990, 800-781-2990, You and your calculator can rest easy today. For most of us this year, April 15th is not tax day. The IRS has delayed its federal tax filing deadline for the most part until May 17th. The delay gives individual filers, tax preparers, and the IRS a chance to look at any changes that may affect this year's filings. There are two exceptions. Anyone who pays estimated taxes, like many small business owners, still must make their usual payment in by April 15th. And victims of February's winter storms who live in Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana have until June 15th to file their taxes. The state Senate in Tennessee passed a bill that bans vaccine passports. If the bill makes it through the state house, it goes to the governor, who will decide whether to sign it into law. Tennessee's Republican Governor Bill Lee expressed his disapproval for vaccine passports earlier this month on Twitter. He said the vaccine should remain a personal choice and private health information should remain private. And over in Montana, Governor Greg Gianforte just issued an executive order banning the development or use of vaccine passports. The move comes after the governors of Florida and Texas signed executive orders for the same reason. A Southern California teacher has been suspected for berating students during a Zoom class. NTD's Eileen Ng has more details. San Marcos High School teacher Alyssa Pirro is caught berating her students over Zoom after their parents push for in-person learning. San Marcos is in San Diego County. In a video tweeted by Reopen California Schools, the English teacher appears to be distraught over parents questioning an educator's abilities. If your parent wants to come talk to me about how I'm not doing a good enough job in distance learning based on what you need as an individual, just dare them to come at me. Because I'm so sick to my stomach of parents trying to tell educators how to do their job. Some parents blame the San Marcos Unified School District for allowing the California Teachers Association to set district policy. In a private Facebook group, one parent wrote, The vast majority of good teachers in our district are being misrepresented by their union and by a handful of teachers that are unfit to be with our children. In another post, he said, The district's lack commitment and focused effort in opening campuses to the fullest extent possible. Recently, the San Marcos Unified School District agreed to switch to a hybrid model for the rest of the school year. In a statement, the school district announced that Piro is on administrative leave and will be afforded due process and privacy rights. Eileen Eng, NTD News, California. One of the largest tulip festivals in the world is underway in Washington state. Our reporter went to colorful fields to see who was out enjoying the flowers. Every April, millions of tulips burst into bloom in Washington's Skagit Valley. Acre after acre of brightly colored tulips bring in hundreds of thousands of visitors to celebrate in a month-long festival. Andrew Miller is one of the men responsible for brightening the tourists' day. Flowers are personal, but there's nothing more personal than tulips. Everybody has a story. Everyone who comes out here has a story about tulips. They have, they have memories, uh, they have uh, associations and connections. To Miller, tulips are more than just flowers. It, it, to me, it really represents spring and hope uh, and, and new opportunities, I think, especially this year. And with so many meaningful flowers, tourists will want to capture the moment. I woke up and I said to myself, like, it's time to go somewhere and enjoy the sunshine. <laughs> Bilichko, an immigrant from Ukraine, is also wowed by Washington state's environment. Yes, I really like it. I mean, I like this state. The nature here is like beautiful. And with families on vacation, there is no shortage of children. Yeah. It, it, it is a great place. 
and I hope that su this summer, that that summer, will make it even better. The festival offers a wide range of entertainment. It's because it has all these beautiful flowers that I've never seen before. They have new structures which you can have pictures with. Loads of nice structures. Everyone will love it. The best part of this whole place is is the tractor ride. Gotta say. Yeah, it was pretty fun. I was kind of scared that we were, that we were gonna crash. But it didn't happen. With so much fun, it can be hard to even choose one's favorite flower. And my favorite tulips in this um, whole entire tulip festival um, are the tulips. The Skagit Valley is the largest commercial producer of tulips in the United States. By volume, it is second only to the Netherlands. Echo Liu and Daniel Hall, NTD News, Washington. And still to come, at the request of President Biden, the White House is sending a delegation to meet with the Taiwanese president. That and more on NTD News. Amid Taiwan-China tensions, President Biden is sending a delegation of former officials to Taiwan. A White House official says this is a personal signal of Biden's commitment to Taiwan. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more on the story. Against a backdrop of aggression from Beijing, the White House is sending an unofficial delegation to Taiwan on Tuesday. The visit comes at the request of President Biden. A White House official says it's a personal signal from Biden about his commitment to Taiwan. The delegation includes a former U.S. senator and two former deputy secretaries of state. They'll meet with Taiwan's president and senior officials on Thursday. The visit will coincide with the 42nd anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act. The Carter administration signed the act in 1979 to maintain commercial, cultural and other relations with the island, though unofficial. Beijing was quick to condemn the meeting. Chinese officials accused the meeting of sending the wrong signals to Taiwan's independence movement. Beijing has long claimed the island as a mainland Chinese province. This despite Taiwan having its own self-elected government, constitution and currency. The delegation being sent is made of former U.S. officials. When asked about future official-level contacts with Taiwan, a White House official replied there are no specific plans at this time. It's a contrast to action under the previous administration. Former U.S. Secretary of Health Alex Azar visited Taiwan in August last year. He's the highest level U.S. official ever to visit the island since the U.S. cut diplomatic ties with Taiwan over 40 years ago. The Philippines said Tuesday it has asked the Chinese regime to remove all vessels in the disputed waters of the South China Sea. In a statement, the Philippines' foreign ministry said it summoned Chinese ambassador Huang Xilian and said Chinese vessels should leave the Whitsun Reef immediately. The foreign ministry reminded Huang that the Philippines won an arbitration case in 2016. It affirms the Philippines' territorial claims over Beijing's. In March, the Philippines spotted over 200 Chinese ships within its territory. Beijing refused to withdraw and insisted that the vessels were sheltering from turbulence. But satellite images show that these Chinese ships have been at the reef since last December. Some of them are apparently part of the Chinese regime's unofficial maritime militia. On the other hand, the Philippines and the U.S. seem to be coming closer. The U.S. is backing the Philippines in the standoff with communist China. On Monday, Philippine and U.S. troops began military exercises to deepen defense cooperation. The drills will last for two weeks. Two days after the attack against the Epic Times printing press in Hong Kong, a French senator shares his concerns. He laments that international institutions and politicians aren't doing enough to help. NTD's David Vives has the story. At a press conference Wednesday, the director of the Hong Kong edition of the Epoch Times condemned the attack on April 12th. Four intruders barged into the printing plant at 4 a.m., destroying computers and printing equipment. Stephen Gregory, the publisher of the Epoch Times U.S. editions, believes the Chinese Communist Party is the perpetrator behind the attack. The CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, has sought to shut down uh, the Epoch Times uh, since we began. French Senator André Gatolin also supports the hypothesis of CCP interference. 
This is totally unacceptable. This is another attack against what is left of democracy and freedom of press in Hong Kong. We can clearly think it is deliberate aggression and organized in the framework of the total repression the CCP is doing in Hong Kong. The senator says he's investigating the recent trial of Hong Kong pro-democracy activists, one of whom he has met. Gatolin says he's very worried about their fate, in particular Andy Lee, who is thought to have been sent to a psychiatric hospital. Gatolin says the attack on the Epoch Times is another step in CCP repression occurring in Hong Kong, and politicians and heads of state should do more to address the situation. This is what is really terrible. There is like a veil of silence on what's happening today in Hong Kong. When we discuss with politicians in the international institutions, everybody says it's a shame, it's a scandal, but this is it. No, there is much to be done yet. And more important, we need to protect the people of Hong Kong. Vives, NTD News, Paris. Coming up, ancient Rome's gladiators are now back in a new exhibition in Naples, Italy. It shows their day-to-day -day life and more. Many children across the globe continue to attend school remotely. In Italy, a fourth grader takes her classes on a hillside accompanied by goats. Find out more here on NTD News. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explain life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-509-8500. Coventry Direct, redefining insurance. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast cable or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times? I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff? I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epoch Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. As shops reopen their doors on the high street, retailers are hoping to make up for lost time. NTD's Jane Worrell looks at the future of brick-and-mortar stores in London. It seems a long time since going shopping, and not just for groceries, a relief for customers and staff. This time we've really missed talking to people as much as they've missed coming into the bookshops. I think we, we've been shut in there doing a sort of mail-order thing, um, probably all going slightly mad. Multiple lockdowns meant shops deemed non-essential were forced to close, driving an increase in online shopping. It's raised the question of the future of bricks and mortar stores. Boarded up shops are a reminder that many didn't make it through the lockdown. For those that did reopen, we may see more integrated online and offline sales, a trend that's increased in recent years. You know, many stores will be using themselves as more of a showroom so that people go in, have a look around, even if they end up buying the same item from the store online. While shopper numbers in London overall were an encouraging sign, some areas like London's financial district have taken a big hit. We've got lots of members who have shops in tube stations in, 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 in Canary Wharf, for instance, which has actually been devastated. 
I do know for a fact that, you know, Canary Wharf has, has opened and the shop's there. And our members are reporting 75% down on trade and they've only been open a few days. He says in general the business rates for retailers on the high street makes it difficult too. But there's a sense of optimism that people will come back and walk into stores once again in the coming months. With COVID, it's accelerated that online shopping presence and people have got more digital, people are more savvy now to doing that type of work. Do I think that they'll stay there? No, I think people will come back to traditional. 15, 16 people in this shop, 60 people across nine shops. Um, you know, we're not a big business and I think you realise how important that, you know, all these little packets of employment are for communities and for other businesses. They all buy coffee, they buy the sandwiches, those things. It's all interlocked. You know, lockdown and absence of, of physical shops, for, for bookshops in particular, has re-established them as, as really central bits of sort of glue in communities and central places for people to enjoy as a leisure. Especially for businesses like this bookshop that's been here for 30 years. It's a shopping experience that can't be replicated online. Thank you. Jane Warrell, NTD News, London. Ancient woodlands have existed for thousands of years despite being under constant threat. In a new report, the Woodland Trust highlights ancient woods and trees and their value to us. NTD's Neil Woodrow brings us more. The Woodland Trust has a new report out called The State of the UK's Woods and Trees. In it, it says that our ancient woods and pastures are irreplaceable artefacts of history, culture and ecology overlaid and interwoven. The Trust has enlisted a team of citizen scientists to help collate the data. I spoke with the lead on this report, Hazel Jackson. She told me more about these older trees. There are ancient and veteran trees that are the beating hearts of our landscapes. They're, they're old uh, trees which offer a, a sort of microhabitat to lots of amazing uh, wildlife that rely on them, solely rely on them. So. They are in the process of documenting the sites of these trees on an inventory. People can sign up online to be part of the team to help locate these ancient trees. And what that helps us do is map the locations of all these really precious trees across our landscape. And by knowing where they are, we can protect them. They currently have 123,000 records on their inventory so far, but Jackson says they've barely scratched the surface. The oak tree is one such ancient tree. It's the National Tree of England, representing strength and endurance. The Martin Oak in Cheshire has a girth of 14 metres. That's the measurement taken around the tree at 1.5 metres from the ground. And it's significant for the ecology. An oak tree, for example, can support over 2,300 different types of wildlife. Only 2.5% of the UK's land area is covered in ancient woodlands. Jackson says they are home to many declining species of birds, butterflies and specialist plants, which we need to protect. And just 7% of our native woodlands are in good ecological condition. Jackson says we need the ancient woods of the future, but we currently lack the diversity of ages and types of tree. Neil Woodrow, NTD News, Epsom, Surrey. You might only know them from movies, but ancient Rome's gladiators are now back in a new exhibition in Naples, Italy. NTD's Arian Pastar has the story. Roman gladiators are the focus of an exhibition in Italy that traces their history and legendary status. Intricately designed bronze helmets, daggers and even the remains of their food are among over 150 relics on show at the National Archaeological Museum in Naples. The exhibition opened online at the end of March because of Italy's lockdown orders. But the measures are expected to be temporary and the exhibition is scheduled to run until January 2022. In the past, gladiators were at the center of a gigantic entertainment business, like today's most famous soccer players. If we could attend a gladiator show today, the experience would be not unlike going to a football stadium. The soldier's gear was a symbol of each gladiator's ethnic background and class. This extraordinary floor mosaic comes from an archaeological site of Augusta Rorica in Switzerland, the oldest known Roman colony on the Rhine. The mosaic is very interesting. It dates back to the end of the 2nd century AD and probably decorated a private house. 
It's about 700 square feet. It was discovered in 1961 and is being shown in all its splendor for the first time in Italy after recent restoration. Piece of Art showcases the legendary fame that gladiators enjoyed all over the world. Arian Pastar, NTD News. Remote schooling is taking its toll on the mental and physical well-being of children across the globe, but a fourth grader in Italy is enjoying a unique learning environment with help from her father's goats. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. Every day, 10-year-old Fiametta Melis climbs up this hill in Caldes, northern Italy, carrying her pink backpack. This beautiful hillside is where Fiametta's father looks after his 350 goats. She connects her computer to the internet with her mother's cell phone and follows her lessons far away from the classroom, like most Italian school children these days. It's a welcome distraction for her classmates and her teachers, stuck studying in their kitchens, bedrooms and living rooms. Yes, I'm able to concentrate. And sometimes when there's a break, I show my classmates and my teachers, the kids and the goats. I move the computer around so they can see the location because they're all from the city at this point. Schools across Italy have been closed or partially closed since the start of the pandemic. So the family came up with a plan. On March 18th, they climbed the hill together to see if the internet connection and battery life would last. Fiametta has been enjoying every single minute ever since. I don't want to be stuck in an office all day. It's nicer to be out in the fresh air. I'd like to be a forest ranger with a horse. That way, I can keep my passion for horses. I can come and visit the goats. There will be a breeder or my dad if he still breeds them. But life as the daughter of a goat herder is no picnic for this young girl. She wakes up at 4.30 in the morning to help her father tend to the animals. And while her classmates are still enjoying their night's sleep, Fiametta is catching the goats to help feed the kids. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Coming up, a musical model train in a German museum sets a Guinness World Record. The train plays music using wine glasses as it chugs down its track. Find out more in just a minute. Soccer players in Turkey noticed an unexpected visitor on the field Tuesday. A stray cat invaded the area as players broke their fast on the first day of Ramadan. Footage released by broadcaster BN Sports Turkey showed the feline on the prowl during the game. Two Turkish soccer teams faced off during the first division game in the Black Sea province of Giresun. Local media reports the game had been on break because of an injury when the players noticed the feline. The critter seemingly took the game's pause as a good time to explore while players broke their fast with bananas and dates. A world record set by a model train in Germany. It gives people a spectacular musical journey by tapping wine glasses along its course. This musical model train now holds a Guinness World Record for the longest melody played by a model train. It's at Germany's miniature Wonderland Museum in Hamburg. Museum founder and model train enthusiast Frederick Brown spent weeks on this project amid the country's virus lockdown. It's not all perfect, but just try to play Verdi with wine glasses, or even worse, the Bolero, if you only have two octaves at your disposal. And that's why I say this world record is a mega world record. It won't be beaten anytime soon, I'm certain of that. The train can produce 20 different classical tunes, including those by Johann Strauss and Beethoven. It chugs along the track lined with about 3,000 liquid-filled wine glasses. But the construction work posed significant challenges for Frederick and his team. First, they had to set up miniature landscapes surrounding the train track, such as tiny versions of cities like Hamburg and Las Vegas. Another challenge was that water in the glasses would evaporate and cause off notes. So we've been looking for solutions. We tried it with plastic wrap to cover the surface and we found out that a light oil, very liquid oil, so not cooking oil or something, it's best to create a layer on top that preserves it and then there's hardly any evaporation. This is the museum's second Guinness World Record. It also boasts the world's largest model train set with a total track length of nearly 10 miles. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan.
have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.